Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with George A. Jones, Chief Executive Officer of Bread for City. George has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. Thank you, George, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Bread. Bread. Talk about bread. Right. So I know the name oftentimes is evocative of kind of the substance of life, if you will. Um, and in a lot of ways that is sort of a, a, a bit metaphorical for what we try to sort of represent. Bread is a, is a nonprofit that's been here in Washington, D.C. for 44 years now. And we've been um, sort of fighting for social justice and doing it through uh, not just bread and through our food pantry. We have five core programs. We have a food pantry, medical clinic, social services program, legal services, clothing room. Uh, and so those five basic programs and basic services we offer to the community in, a hope, in an effort to sort of be a kind of safety net, a sort of a place that people can turn to when they need immediate redress to one of those or any combination of those sort of issues, hunger, health, um, legal services, uh, counseling services, clothing. So those are our core programs. We've been doing that for some 40 plus years. Um, but we also have an advocacy department that is has become a more and more important aspect of our work because we know that on the one hand you need to be able to meet people where they are, which is what our core programs do. But then we know there are systemic problems that really sort of perpetuate poverty, we believe, in cities and in the, in the country. And those, those problems oftentimes take sort of political solutions. So you need, to have, uh, you need to have a voice that talks about what are the reforms that could help improve the conditions for the families that we serve. And, and the, the powerful thing here is that you meet people, as you say, you meet people where they live. The immediate need might be addressed by uh, your food pantry uh, or your medical clinic. Um, and if somebody is not healthy, if somebody is hungry, uh, it's very difficult to think about anything else. Exactly. And then you provide other types of services. They are more in the guise of transformative services, allowing people to have the tools, have access to the tools to transform themselves. Talk about how you actually shape those services. How do you staff those services? Because this is not an organization with, that grew up as sort of people parachuting into the neighborhood. This is an organization that has really evolved through the neighborhood connection that you have. We do see ourselves as a part of the community and try to engage our community members, not only just receiving the services, but helping us sort of shape them and, and structure them and, and oftentimes even help deliver them. We've got internships. So in our pre-employment program, for instance, uh, a number of the folks who live in our community will go through the pre-employment program, which is about a 10-week program where there's you know, different modules uh, designed around everything from self-esteem and sort of confidence building to interviewing and dressing for success and all language, the things, language, dress, all the things that go in, into being sort of, on time, right. executive management right. skills, the whole idea of of how do you how are you early for a meeting? How do you present yourself? These are things that that people who have had different advantages have received, sure. but they but people who don't have uh, such advantages are perfectly capable. They just need to have some support and, and somebody who can sit and, and, and do what we all who have had those advantages have had, have some patient instruction. I think the key word you use there is support. That is exactly what our pre-employment program sort of really is the foundation of. It's a, it's a space where we support people and we, we encourage the, uh, the uh, folks who attend those and participate in those programs to support each other. So it becomes a real kind of source and a space for support for people who are trying to get back into the workforce who may have been chronically unemployed and, uh, and, and looking to get back on their feet. Uh, we also have, um, we also have our, an advocacy department that is, that's really interesting because it is at the same time a place where people can get personal development skills. Mm -hmm. we, we also have a module, a 10 week module where community members can come in and learn about the various public policy issues, in particular the housing crisis and how they can get involved in the public discourse about what's needed in their community and what are the policies that need to be restructured and how to fight for increased dollars for affordable housing, how to deal with, as a friend of mine likes to say, how to deal with a billion dollar problem that historically we've been trying to deal with as if it was just a million dollar problem. We've lost uh, 40,000 uni 40, units of affordable housing in Washington, D.C. in the last decade. 
40,000 units. And that's, so it's not just 40,000 people, that includes families who would be in. So you're talking about tens of thousands of people who, uh, who get displaced when that kind of housing goes away. And so we, so not, we don't just, Bradford City doesn't just go and talk about those issues, but we help train community members to go to public policy makers and talk sort of authentically about what it means to not have access to, to housing like that. What do you say to people who say, displacement is inevitable? Um, it's, it's just sort of the way things are. That's, that's you build neighborhoods, um, and then somebody comes in and builds a, a, an apartment building uh, on that neighborhood or an office complex upon that neighborhood. That's sort of the free market at work, and, and everybody ought to adjust and get out of the way and get out of the way of progress. Well, first of all, I say that's not fair. I mean, that's a theory that seems like, I guess it's some survival of the fittest kind of theory. And, you know, we're, as a country and as a city, certainly we're better than that to simply say, you know, the strong and the, and the powerful and the, the wealthy. So would, you treat, would you treat your brother that way? I certainly wouldn't. And so, yeah, that's, that's that, so first I start there, that's, we're better than that. But if, you, if you're looking for sort of what's the, what's the sort of st structural solution, um, I think it comes with public policy making. I think that policy makers are the ones who are positioned to temper how a, a city evolves, how development evolves. I, I've said to people a number of times, when I see in D.C. These, these cranes come in and the high rises come up, sometimes it seems like overnight. And it's just it's easy to build affordable housing as it is to build market rate or you know, these uh, sort of luxury apartment units. And you just need the political will. You need, um, you need the brains to sort of think through how to sort of create equity and balance and, and, uh, and sort of some stratification that, is, that serves the entire community when you're talking about developing a city. And one of the things that, I, one of the data sets I always tell is that the average family that Bradford City serves uh, has an income of less than $10,000 Less a than $10,000 in Washington, in Washington D.C., D.C., in our nation, nation's capital. And so it's a tough, it's a tough hill to road a hole when you talk about how do you create a city that can accommodate uh, community members whose incomes are so low. And I think you have to deal with those things head on. We need solutions that deal with income disparity and deal with low incomes and, and high rates of unemployment. We need solutions that creates housing that's affordable so that people aren't paying 50, 60, 70 percent of their income on housing. Uh, we need public schools that work. And we've got a lot of work to, to do, but I think that this country is wealthy enough, and I know this city is, that it could actually solve these problems, again, with a commitment to, to addressing those things head on. How do, you, how do you create that change and an investment that, that can actually function and help people with the process of lifting themselves into a place where they have more power? We have to have a long view about about solving and, and dealing with those sort of challenges. And my, my opinion is that there are people who are able-bodied and, and working age, but who have been sort of um, locked out in a way outside of the workforce. Uh, they may be on TANF or some other sort of fixed income, um, um, unemployment. Uh, and I think, one, I think one of the creative things to do at the, at the, short, at the front end of the, the crisis, if you will, is to figure out ways to, to infuse those households with more money. And I'll tell you what sort of continues to sort of percolate in my head is this idea that if a person's on, right now the way our system works is if you're a person with a low income, receiving it from TANF or from um, unemployment insurance or, or from a, a, a low paying job, that there's a penalty to pay oftentimes, particularly for those first two, right. if you create another stream of revenue, if you find work. Uh, and I think we should be doing just the opposite. As opposed to reducing what but people on TANF probably get what, less than $1,000 a month, if that, maybe more like $800 a month. So it's not a lot of money to live off of. Um, but right now, if you, were to, if you were to have the $800 and then to go out and make money at a, at a legitimate job, they'd reduce your TANF, right. oftentimes to the point that there's no net gain. Right. And the truth of the matter is, we have to be more progressively sort of oriented than that because um, because the, the, fundamentally, I believe the problem and the challenge for the families that we serve is that their incomes are way too low to, to, to really sort of be competitive in this society. I was talking to some developers out in Southeast D.C. recently who were talking about building and investing in all these institutions, you know, including nonprofit institutions, but private institutions that were going to be 
um, developed in Southeast D.C. For the, for the community. And one of the things I said to them is, you know, if we don't address the income problem for the families living in this community, those institutions are going to be sort of immaterial to them. They're going to be superfluous because they will not be able to, they won't have the resources to, to take advantage of, to utilize sort of the benefit and the value that these institutions they're envisioning funding uh, have. And so we need some really progressive uh, policies around income disparity and around low incomes. We need, which is in another way to deal with that, is to really invest in the subsidized housing. I know the government 30 years ago sort of got into subsidized housing and over the past 30 years it sort of soured on that idea. But the truth of the matter is it was the right thing to do then and it would be the right thing to do now because it is, it is just almost impossible for folks who have low incomes, whether they're working uh, class folks or folks who are uh, out of the workforce to live in this city and live in cities like Washington, D.C. if the government doesn't do a lot more to make um, housing more affordable for them. How is the tone in the country, the shifting tone in the country from the Obama administration, the first African-American uh, president of the United States, uh, to the Trump administration, where it seems that, um, that um, racial hatred and race baiting um, has uh, been given a new voice. How has that affected your work and your advocacy and, and also your programs here in the nation's capital? Well, you might be surprised at my answer. You won't be surprised at one part of it. It really has made, made us sort of think more intention. I think as a city as a whole, this city has, like a lot of urban areas in the country, we've had to start to think about the fact that, that there were racial divides that are now sort of much more obvious. And so a lot of us are really intentionally sort of thinking about our work in terms of a racial lens and, you know, how do these disparities play themselves out and how does the divide sort of show up in terms of the socioeconomic well-being of, the, of all the citizens. And, and I think to some extent the administration, uh, though probably unwittingly, has made it almost, if not um, okay to talk about it, it certainly made it clear that, they, that we have issues that are deep-seated and that, it, that we can no longer say that we don't have a race and a racism problem in America because I think we've seen too many things on TV and too many cases where it, it's just clear that we, we have a divide. And a lot of people would even say that President Obama was a part of it. The truth of the matter is the divide probably predates this president and the previous president. And I think the it's divide, just- The divide yeah. predates the founding That's of the country. Right. And I think it's just time for us to deal with it much more intentionally, much more explicitly. George Jones, thank you so much for explaining to us the great work of Bread for the City. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Appreciate it.